All right. So uh, I'm going to ask Jason if uh, Jason would introduce himself, and then we'll have the guest uh, and briefly introduce themselves. Yes, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jason Perez. I'm a third year mechanical engineering technology major. Um, and as Taj said, I, I am working with the Department of Division and Diverse, uh, Diversity. Um, and I'm excited to be here with all of you. And I'm excited to learn about these students' experiences. Um, and I hope you guys are excited too. Thank you. All right. Um, so actually, since we're a small small group, let me let, let one more person in. Since we're a smaller group, I'm gonna add, have the uh, participant uh, sorry, the audience members introduce themselves very briefly. Um, so if you wouldn't mind uh, unmuting yourself and uh, stating your name and where uh, you may work on campus or uh, what year in school you are in and what you might be studying. So uh, let's start with uh, Jude. Well, thank you, Tara John. It's always a pleasure joining this diversity session. Uh, my name is Jude Abala. I'm a faculty at RIT China, and I teach in global literature. Thank you. Let's go to Kathy. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kathy Clark. I'm a web developer at NTID, and I'm happy to meet all of you today. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, let's go to Cecilia. For you to introduce yourself. Cecilia, are you there? Okay, we'll skip Cecilia for now. Let's go to Colleen. Hi folks, uh, my name is Colleen Holcomb. I am the Health Promotion Specialist uh, with Health Promotion and Wellness and Program Services. And if a four-legged furry animal hops up, his name is Cedric. <laughs> they do like to do that during the calls. All right. He's and looking at me like he might do it soon, so. <laughs> uh, let's go to Pamela. Pamela. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Pam Carmichael, and I work at NTID in the marketing and communications area. All right. Thank you, Pamela. Pam. All right. So let's have our uh, guest uh, st uh, student storytellers uh, introduce themselves briefly, um, and then we'll jump into some of the uh, more specific questions. So, Emmanuel, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, my name is Emmanuel. I'm currently actually a I actually, I'm a graduate student at RIT in computer science. Recently graduated my bachelor's in May in electrical engineering. And I've been at RIT for five years. It's currently my sixth year. And I should be graduating in May 2021 or fall 2021. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica. I am currently a second year electrical engineering student here at RIT. And I'm really excited to be here today. All right, thank you both. All right, so the first question is, uh, tell us about where you call home. And I recognize that home might be complicated uh, for, for lots of different reasons for people. So wherever you, you know, call home, we're gonna ask you to describe uh, your, some of your fondest memories about home um, and then also how it's different than RIT. Uh, Jessica, you want to start? Sure. So I'm from the Buffalo area, not too far from here. And specifically, I'm from East Aurora, New York. And that's a very kind of small, close-knit community. Um, so I went to school all the way from kindergarten to high school graduation with the same group of students. So it was very familiar. And then coming to RIT was just a completely different experience. I was just kind of thrown into it, but it's been a really great experience because it's allowed me to 
learn and grow and meet new people and experience new things. Thank you. So, I mean, mine's a little bit slightly complicated because I'm originally from Nigeria, but I've been to different countries because my dad's a diplomat. I, when I was born, I lived in Argentina for five years. So I basically grew up there before going back to Nigeria. And I stayed there for like my, so I did my kindergarten in Argentina. Then I came to Nigeria, I did my elementary school and middle school, or primary school in Nigeria before I came here, before I did my high school. I did my high school in New in Westchester, New York, New Rochelle High School, which is around 700 people, which is a lot bigger than my primary school, which was around middle school, which is around like 100 people. And I stayed there for four years before I came here, and I've been in Rochester since 2015. And pretty much, I think I have a very distinct situation of just moving around a lot. So I don't say I have a concrete place to stay home. In fact, funny enough, I think this has been, the, I think the United States has been the most longest time I've been in one place ever. So I could call here home, but not really. As fun as memories, I have different memories from different times. So I have memories when I was in Nigeria with my family. I have memories when I was in Argentina when I was a kid. I have a lot of memories in RIT and I have a lot of memories back in high school. So I only really have a distinct memory of a place called home because I don't really have a concrete home and it's something I'm still trying to figure out as I'm going through life right now. All right, thank you. Um, I've got a follow up to that uh, before you go, uh, Jason. Um, so is is there for both of you is there you know one thing that when you kind of compare one of those homes or, or multiple of those homes uh that makes that different than rit or, or what you know as you compare those those different settings what's sort of at least one thing um, that stands out to you that's different Wait, can you repeat the question again? I kind of missed yeah. it. So the question is, as you think about for you, Emmanuel, you have multiple homes. And so you can choose to think about one of them or multiple. But as you kind of compare that experience to your experience here at RIT, you know, just in terms of environment, is there anything that stands out that's sort of significantly different, you know, as you compare those different environments? I mean, that's a very, that's a good question. I would say that in comparison on my whole life, now, for example, Nigeria has a very formal kind of representation in terms of elder and age. So there's a level of, there's a level of giving respect of being someone older and a of formality of how you have to act in certain situations compared to the United States where it's a lot more casual and that more have a, a more casual relationship with a professor per se. So like Jerry, I can't necessarily walk to professor's office hours where I hear myself. While if I hear, I can easily just come here and just if I need a question or I need help, I can easily ask the professor and it would be willing to help me. In addition to that, I say RIT has a very distinct student body in terms of like, it has a very big diversity, in per, mostly in personalities. Like I've seen a lot of different characteristics of people and behaviors of people ranging from one spectrum to another, compared to being in Nigeria where everything seems very synonymous and very um, similar and very hom uh, homophobe, as a homophobe. Um, very, they're just very, very similar in terms of personality. And in comparison to my high school time when I went to Westchester, New York, and what New Rochelle, where it's a lot of diversely diverse group of people with African Americans, Asians, and all these groups. Personality wise, it was very, my the way of how I lived was very similar, where it had a more down subsession of groups who had very similar personality. I was, so I would say I already had the most diverse type of personality, maybe not as to body or maybe just race, while in our, my, back in my high school, it was more diverse in race and everything, but personality was very similar, while Nigeria just basically similar in everywhere in every aspect. Thank you. 
I would kind of echo the part Emmanuel said about the people at RIT kind of being different in personality. Um, in my hometown, we were all kind of similar. We had similar experiences. And at RIT, everyone has different experiences because they've come from different places and everyone is studying a lot of different things. Like RIT might be Rochester Institute of Technology, but there's still like a very significant group of people who study the arts or who study um, technology. There's just such a wide range and you can really see that in the student body and their perspective on different things. Thank you both. I'm going to turn it over to Jason. Yeah, um, interesting. Uh, the next um, question would be, how do you guys define diversity? You know, how has it changed in your community or even here studying at RIT? So I was, so I think that's about, I think it's a good question because I've I've gone, gone through like a different journey with understanding what diversity was. Because when before I came here, before I came to the United States, I never really saw, I never really thought about the idea of diversity or race. I think because being surrounded by people from exactly the same country, I would say diversity back then was more so ethnic groups. So it was Nigeria has like over 150 people from different ethnic groups, and I was part of one of them. So it was, we were more classified based on your language and your culture rather than pretty much skin color because everyone looked exactly the same. When I came here to the United States, the notion of race became more prevalent in my mind where I started realizing that I was classified based on my color of my skin, which was something that was hard to grasp. So back then my idea of race switched from, idea of diversity switched to idea of race. So you're either African American, you're either Asian American, you're either Hispanic or white. And it was something I still kind of like was having a lot of grasping issues with because my personality never really fit the idea of what a black American was. When I came to RIT, that still kind of had, I still had a lot of struggles with that because majority of my personalities and my interests more aligned to the idea of what a non African American should be interested in. So I was having a lot of like cultural identity. Oh, I, did, I had like a lot of identity crisis with the idea of me being seen myself as black. But as I'd gone through and grown and matured, I started looking at diversity as not only on the idea of skin color, but more personality, that someone could be diverse of their thinking, their political ideology, their interest, their lifestyle, their clothing style. And people, everyone, had, everyone is diverse in one way or the other in terms of their thinking not one person is similar to another person. You might share the same skin color, but you might have different ideologies about economics. You might have different ideologies in terms of um, social issues. You might have different ideologies in terms of your interests, your skills and everything. Like for example, I might be black, but I might, I'm, I'm, I'm also a computer science major, but if you bring a person who is an art major or more in a more artistic area, we both have different ways of thinking and saying things, and that's something I consider diversity. For me, when I was younger, like in high school, I considered diversity to be mostly different cultural experiences and different races. But now that I've kind of come to IIT and I've expanded on um, what I consider to be diversity. And it's sort of, to me, a different perspective that someone has based on their different life experiences or their different abilities. Um, so someone who's good at art is going to have a different perspective than someone who's good at science. Someone who's religious will have so a different perspective than someone who's not religious. And these different perspectives um, are very diverse and they make up diversity um, in a group of people. Thank you. Um, so what has been, uh, what has been your personal experience with diversity on campus? How have you engaged it, um, you know, by attending events or studying the content? You know, just curious on what has been your interaction with diversity on campus. Um, could be positive, could be challenging. 
uh, but just curious on what that experience has been like for you. Okay, I'll go. Um, I think that being at RIT, one of the unique things we have is NTID. So um, as students, we're kind of able to engage with the deaf and hard of hearing community in a way that you might not be able to elsewhere. And so one great experience is no voice zone where you can go and learn like some sign so that you can communicate with people who don't communicate the way you do. And that's really unique. Then I also think RIT has kind of some groups um, that I've been involved with specifically would be like Society of Women Engineers and we at RIT. And those two groups are focused a lot on getting women involved in tech and in STEM and engineering. Um, and I like think it's really good that RIT has those opportunities because it shows that they want to encourage diversity in STEM. So I will say my experience in diversity has been both positive and negative in one way and the other, but I can start with the positive side. So I think one of the biggest thing I like about RIT is it does have the, it does have a diverse groups in terms of women engineering as we have different groups that support different, this pretty much the, um, groups that are like low in communities for women, African Americans, Asian groups, and everyone has that community here. But my, one of my biggest complaints, so this is not really RIT in general, but my complaint in general is that why the diversity is there, it's very easy to avoid the diversity. I think a good example is NTID. I would be honest, I've been in RIT for five years and if I didn't want to interact with the NTID community, I could easily avoid them very easily because my classes don't really have many people who are hard of hearing. I don't really, I'm not really, don't have the experience to really interact with people who are hard of hearing because they all have their own subsection at Ellingston area. So if I didn't really want to interact with them, let's say for some any reason, I could just avoid that area and my life, my experience at RIT would not change. And that also, it still also adds to the fact that a lot of things, like different groups have their own community and their own bubble, like Greek life, I'm in Greek life right now. And one of my biggest ish things I've noticed is that if I want to stay in the Greek life bubble, I could easily stay in the Greek life bubble and not interact with anyone and graduate, I'll be fine. Same way with engineering bubble, like it's so easy to stay in your own bubble, which I won't really say is already right fault. It's just basically a, a situation where you, you create a community for groups and focus your energy on really supporting the groups. One of the biggest things we would love to do is kind of like allow people outside the group to kind of see what is the perspective of people in those groups, like having like maybe talks or being, create a phone room for people of those groups to be able to talk to people. But because of a lot of the experience has been creating a safe, a safe space for all these groups, there hasn't really been opportunities for people to kind of talk about people from outside the group to be able to actually get to experience or get to meet these people unless they actually are, unless you actually want to. So it would be good if RIT could like expand its outreach by letting groups from diff different groups be able to actually, let me say, say their voice out, out to RIT so people who are outside so can hear their voice rather than everyone being in their own bubble and if they don't want to interact with another group, they can avoid it. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, I'll probably have a follow up to that later, but I'll, I'll have Jason uh, ask his question. Uh, yeah, can you share two to three resources that you found or would recommend to others um, to participate in to increase understanding and diversity? Um, these resources could be like attending cultural festivals or books or films or Netflix shows, anything that you guys see that would help others in understanding diversity. So I'm a, I'm a very big reader. So I would say just reading up different, just reading up different cultures in general. Like if you want to learn about a different culture, you can, the internet is a very vast information. And even Wikipedia, as much as people might make fun of Wikipedia, Wikipedia is very, very like, kept on, it's made sure that its points are valid. 
So if you really want to learn about a group, just look up the group, like search about history, especially if you're, if it, let's say you want to learn about African American history in the country. If you look up history of African Americans and your struggles, you will hear, you will see the full dialogue from the beginning of the 1600s to now and see every single thing that's happened throughout there. A lot of books that I only really have books in general that I can recommend top of my head, but if you look up different books that people um, have wrote, writ, you can definitely look that, search them up. If you look interested in shows, a lot of Netflix, a lot of YouTube videos have decent like information about different er eras. Like if you want to learn about the Tulsa Massacre, you can easily look that up, and it'll be a huge documentary about it. So just looking up to the internet about different diverse groups you're interested in, or even if it's not the same related to race, it could be related to personalities. Like say you want to learn about people who are in the more artistic area, you can just look up videos about art majors and what they do. Honestly, like if I ever rambled, I guess the full situation, just looking up to the internet is one of the best ways you can find information about diversity. And on campus, I would say that going to different groups, like if you want to learn about African Americans, African students, you can go to oh, guys who are African students at different clubs on campus that are, that are, what's it called? So the different clubs on campus that have their own groups and and their own like knowledge about it. So if you want to learn about a group, just go to their club meetings and you learn a lot of information about them. For me, a really great um, resource to learn more about diversity is the people I'm friends with. I'm lucky to have a mildly diverse um, group of friends. So I've made it a point to learn more about the different causes that are important to them. For example, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, what's happening with the indigenous community um, and the current struggle over in Armenia. Um, I also think that social media and the internet are very valuable. Um, I found that there are like social media pages and hashtags and whatnot that'll allow you to easily find information on something that's important to you or something that you want to learn more about. And then I personally enjoy podcasts. So if I'm looking to learn more about something, sometimes I'll put on a podcast um, about it so that I can just kind of listen to it as I go about my day and learn more. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, Jessica, is there is there you know one or two podcasts that you listen to pretty regularly that you would recommend for us? Um, one of the ones I've listened to recently, they haven't put in putting out like new content. So I just listened to some of their older content, but it's a podcast called Tech Forward. Mm -hmm. And the episode I listened to recently dealt with helping low income women and non-binary people get into the tech industry. And what I found really interesting was um, the woman who was involved with that movement had also started the hashtag I look like an engineer movement. Thank you. All right, um, so at this time we are going to uh, invite our audience uh, members uh, to ask our guest storytellers, our students, um, any questions that you may have of them, any clarifying questions based on what they shared um, or other questions that might be floating around in your, in your mind. You can use the chat function to type that in and um, myself or Jason can restate it uh, and or you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly or unmute and sign um, and we can have our interpreters uh, translate that for us. So any questions from our audience? <clears throat> All right, we have two in the chat. Um, First one is from Jude, um, directing at uh, Emmanuel, um, stating that Jude is stating, I'm also Nigerian. 
um, and share your concept of home. I appreciate your insights. I would like to know how you would apply the concept of diversity, equity, and inclusion in a Nigerian setting. And uh, you are probably aware of the hashtag NSAR protests going on right now. So question is, how would you apply diversity, equity, and inclusion um, as concepts to what's happening in Nigeria based on your, your own knowledge and experience? That's a good, uh, well, I have a lot. That's actually an interesting question because my sister actually asked me that. I think the thing with Nigeria is, I won't even call, I, I would say this, maybe this may be controversial to say, but I won't call Nigeria a really diverse place, in my opinion. Yes, it might be diverse in terms of the number of groups that are in Nigeria, but the mentality is very, very one sided. In a sense, everyone thinks about it's roughly the same especially the older generation versus the younger generation. For example, if, especially because Nigeria is a very religious country, I would say that everyone follows a very religious mindset about a lot of things. So for example, if you're LGBT, you're not really going to have a good experience in Nigeria, as I'm also LGBT. So it's, I would say that in terms of the concept of diversity, Nigeria is a very one-minded like my say about things very traditionalist and very culturalist that if you don't follow what your culture does you're kind of seen as an outcast comparatively here where you might be african american but you might have a different way of thinking or if you might be asian but you might have a different way of thinking or different style different mentality even though you might come from a very traditional home so i would say that nigeria has a lot of issues in terms of inclusion that and inclusion and equality that especially the NSARS movement is a good example of in a sense is the extent of where is it is a clash between what the younger generation think versus the older generation thing and it's a very good example of where when the voices of people who demand change are ignored it leads to a pretty much a protest and a aggressive approach towards it. And especially what happened yesterday there when the protesters got shot at, it shows pretty much how there's a lot of things that need to be changed in the country currently, starting from the boards. And even with the protests, I think I've heard a lot of situations where I don't know, it's just it's, it's a very it's a very like big load topic and very big question, but I would say that Nigeria has a lot of ways to go in terms of diversity, in court, equity, and inclusion than it is right now. Thank you. Um, so next question is from Colleen, and Colleen asks, "What are the, what are the most inviting things?" to see at events on campus to help a diverse array of students feel excited coming to events. All right, so when I guess sort of when an event is happening going on, you know, what what would it take to make it feel like it's a welcoming inviting uh, place for people to celebrate their own diversities in the space or celebrate perhaps the diversity that's being focused on with the event. I would say making sure that the space and the event is comfortable for everyone present and making sure that they feel like this is a safe space to share their experiences and to listen to other people's experiences. I think making sure people feel safe and comfortable is very important and getting them to open up and share their experiences. For events in general, I just think making sure that when you're promoting an event, it doesn't seem that you're only inviting one particular group, like it's pretty much spreading out the voice and the message and making sure the event is very inclusive to everyone. So that while that is very hard to do because some of your events might not, like for example, if you're saying, I want to have, suppose, let's imagine like COVID wasn't a thing, so probably, if you say you want to make like a football game, 
they want to make a four game football game among all students that could be not inclusive to people who have disabilities who can't actually have the exact same situation so it's just making sure that you make as much many events that can include many people as possible you might not include certain people and that's okay if as long as you're not include none like this is including a huge group of people or making sure that there's at least an event and there's a thing for everyone on campus that they can participate if they can't play the soccer game maybe they could watch it or they could be able to actually participate or something or you're making a large event you make more events that can also cover people who can't do certain things maybe they're not as physically fit just trying to make sure that the event you're planning can include as many people and you think about people from different backgrounds in, in consideration. Thank you. So next question is from uh, Pam. So uh, what are your plans for the future? And how do you see diversity playing uh, a role in your future? For me, um, right now, I'm looking at co-oping in the next couple semesters. So in my search for co-op jobs, I've been trying to identify job opportunities that will take me to different parts of the country or even the world, because I want to be able to experience places that are different from Buffalo, that are different from Rochester and bring that perspective back with me and use it to make myself better. And then even looking past um, co-op and into graduation and getting a full-time job, my goal is to get a job at a company that has a passion for diversity and wants to hire a diverse group of employees. And because um, I feel like that is something that I'm also passionate about. Um, I like believe that having a diverse group of minds is ultimately going to lead to the best solution to a problem. So ideally I would work at a company that believes in diversity. Thank you. Manuel, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, oh. Sorry, I might my, my, my brain is kind of farted for some reason. Um, so I'm playing. So one of my goals is that I want to get a PhD in social computing and try and build algorithms that will help people from who are in more disenfranchised groups. I'm I'm a computer science master, so I'm planning to get my PhD in computer science. And something I've realized is how artificial intelligence is coming coming a very big relevant topic in the future. But one of the biggest things I've been noticing, a lot of people I've been noticing is the lack of AI ethics, where a lot of the AI algorithms are being made and a lot of like social networking algorithms are being made with not a lot of people in mind. They're mostly made with the more majority group, which, have, which are more cis white males. And I want to work on pretty much debiasing these algorithms, working on these algorithms to make sure that they do not um, affect people from disadvantaged groups a lot less. And I also want to be a professor because I really like teaching. So that's kind of one of my particular career goals. Great, thank you. I was, I was just reaching over to my uh, bookcase and wondering if uh, Emmanuel, you've uh, read the algorithm, Algorithms of Oppression book. It's probably hard. To see. I've actually heard about that, and actually, it's one of my reading lists for my paper I'm writing for my class. So I'm planning. I'm actually planning to read that some very, very soon. Once school doesn't overwhelm me. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we have an, uh, another question, and this one's directed at uh, Emmanuel um, from Kathy. So it states, uh, Emmanuel, related to your feeling uh, that it is possible to have no interaction with deaf or hard of hearing students, do you feel that you and other students at RIT make an effort to get involved 
in the deaf community here? Well, I actually like this question. So I say, I would say during my first three years in RIT, I didn't really try to make an effort, which is why I kind of brought it up because if I didn't really care much about it, I can easily just not do anything about it. However, I did interact. I did have a friend of mine who was an interpreting major who I've actually have good friends with. And she kind of started like open my eyes more about the community more. And I got into ASL, which is some of the thing I'm actually currently applying to a research project around. So I would say that ever since my third year, I've been trying my effort in terms of getting involved in the NTID um, community as much as possible. A lot of my friends are interpreting majors now, I have friends who are hard of hearing. I'm actually slowly learning ASL from my own, my own personal like understanding because I also just want to learn different language because I'm interested in linguistics. And you, so I kind of want to clarify the, the uh, statement I made. So it's not like, oh, I, people, I didn't really want to make an effort. It's just like, I wasn't really immersed into it. And I think that's kind of the biggest thing is that when you're not immersed into a group, you don't really feel comfortable or you're not really like because the group is bad, but because you're not used to the norm of people who don't, who can hear. So getting out of a comfort zone is something that's a little bit scary for a lot of students, especially college students who are at the age of 18, 21. But there's a lot of ways you can actually immerse people into it. For example, when I became an orientation leader, one of the biggest things we started doing was the ASL word of the day. So I got really much immersed into ASL by people who are interpreting majors teaching me ASL a little bit. I got to work with people who are hard of hearing, so I got to actually understand more of that backstory a little bit more. So it was a little, it was a lot of like me being having the opportunity to meet all these people who were pretty much hard of hearing and who or who are deaf that maybe actually start immersing myself more into it, which is why the situation where if students are pretty much, I won't say forced to, but in a way are given the opportunity, no opportunity, actually given opportunity is actually a bad word. If students are pretty much experience other groups on campus just openly out of like nowhere, instead of it being secluded in one particular area that I have to go to the actually those groups, I definitely think people will be immersed themselves into more diverse communities because they are actually like seeing it every day by day rather than just being their own bubble 24 7. Thanks. Jessica, do you have any any thoughts um, on that, you know, specific question or, you know, I would broaden in and generally say uh, or ask, um, you know, how can we encourage um, more students to get outside their bubble? Right, you mentioned you have a relatively diverse group, um, and that might not be the case for other uh, students on campus in terms of their friend circles. But you have any thoughts on how um, RIT can support, maybe not force, maybe force <laughs> um, students to sort of get out of their bubble? Um. That's a tough question because I know that sometimes students are kind of um, stubborn and don't really want to get out of their bubble because it's what they see as comfortable. Um, but I really believe in educating people. And so if RIT can educate students to the best of their ability on diversity and different groups of people, I think then they'll have the best chance of getting people to engage with these groups even more on campus. So I know RIT does do a bit of um, education on the deaf and hard of hearing community and ASL, but um, potentially even increasing that to encourage students to further engage with that community um, might be helpful. Um, RIT acknowledges the indigenous community to a degree with the fact that our campus is built on their land. But I think if they made an effort to acknowledge that even more and educate students even more, then more students would be involved with that and kind of um, be more an understanding of the indigenous community. Thank you, appreciate that. And um, I'm looking up a link right now to eventually share in a chat, um, but what I'm doing so any other questions from the, the audience. 
Let's see, Pam, uh, Pamela has uh, asked one. Uh, what are your thoughts about interactions between students and faculty and staff beyond just classroom or required interactions? So I, I guess in some ways, do you, do you think those interactions between students and faculty and staff are constructive or positive? Are they challenging? Um, I guess that's partly what Pamela, Pam is asking. And if not, Pam, please clarify. All right. Any th any thoughts on that? I don't see a clarification. So, any thoughts, uh, Manuel, Jessica, on the student, faculty, staff um, interactions? Had I guess had they been positive? Had they been challenging? Um, would you like more of them? Um, I enjoy engaging with my professors. A lot of my professors are male um, professors. But when they kind of make the effort to engage with me and get involved with um, projects that are that I'm passionate about, it kind of shows to me that they like very much support women in engineering and want women to get involved in engineering and just a general sense of increased diversity in engineering. So I find that reassuring and very comforting um, to know because sometimes it is a struggle being a woman in STEM. So to have that reassurance, it's very comforting. Uh, I would say that uh, I know back in my engineering degree, my interaction with my faculty were very mixed in a sense, where there were some faculty that I had great interaction with and some faculty that I just didn't really have a good interaction with. However, I think ever since I switched my major and been more switched into, not switched into, but graduate and been in the CS department and doing more research, I've had very more positive interaction with my professors. I think of all my work I've done since I started my master's program, I've all been positive where my professors are willing to listen to me, willing to actually take, when I, when I was going through a lot of like issues during the summer, my professor I was taking the summer away was very understanding and willing to actually like, it take my time to actually like make sure I was doing well in class. So I would say that it has been very positive and I really would love more faculty and students and staff um, interaction because it creates more of a very, very mutual relationship and makes the students actually feel like these faculty and staff actually care about my education rather than just it feeling like it's a problem for them. Thank you. Thank you both for your, your responses. And uh, yeah, I can, I can relate to one part you were saying, Emmanuel, when you make that transition and, and Jessica, if you go to grad school, you may, you may experience this too, but when you transition to grad school, there is a different kind of relationship that happens often between, you know, faculty and students, usually one of, um, uh, you know, I would say more visible display of respect, more engagement, you know, that, that you talked about, rather than uh, when we're all when we're in undergrad, it's, a, it's, you know, it's different, maybe because it's just a smaller group. <laughs> you know, you don't have like, 200 students in a class you're engaging with, you have a much smaller population. So maybe that that's one reason. All right, we have uh, one more question here and then we'll wrap up for today. Uh, this question is from Jason. Um, and so Jason asks, uh, in your opinion, what are some roadblocks that prevent diversity conversations and education from happening on campus? So I think you, you you both kind of talked a little bit about the bubble, right? That being kind of one barrier. So are there any other roadblocks or barriers that will prevent, you know, more interaction or more engagement with diversity in education or just general conversation about diversity topics? I think one thing that might be a roadblock is people not wanting to admit when they're wrong or when they don't know everything. Um, 
because people like to think that they know things they want to be able to engage in conversation, but then um, it's hard for them to kind of admit that, hey, I don't know everything about this topic. Can you tell me more about it? Or what are some resources I can use to learn more about this? Thank you. I think uh, to, to go off on that point, I think first, I think something that will help students be able to actually have more diverse conversation is the at least the willingness to actually admit that they don't know something. I think something that we have gone through in our life in education is that we don't know how to really admit when we are making mistakes or when we're wrong because we are being graded on being correct and right and everything. And because of the consequence of knowing not knowing something, people tend to kind of be scared of actually having conversations where people tend to call them out or think they are one thing when they don't understand something. So I think first thing, like a, a forum where students can be able to actually say something, but they respond to it, unless they actually are being very like trying to trigger a natural aggressive response is to be understanding and willing to actually correct them when they're being wrong and actually be able to actually teach students that it's okay, teach people that it is okay to be wrong as long as you're willing to actually take the correction. Thank you both for that insight. I, I would uh, definitely second that or th second and third that. Um, so as we get ready to close, I'll just point out uh, in the chat, um, I sent the link um, to an event that's happening tomorrow if you have time, but it just sort of builds on what uh, the two uh, guests have shared um, in terms of opportunities to learn about people who are different from you. And so uh, this event tomorrow will focus on Mexican Americans um, and the value of learning about Mexican American culture, particularly for Mexican American students, but of course everyone can benefit from that. So if you have availability, um, follow the link and register um, and, uh, and hopefully you enjoy that experience. If not, we, we hope to see you at future events, including uh, future What's Your Diversity programs. Um, and so I think we have two more this semester, maybe three, um, but probably mid-November and then uh, early December. So I wanna thank um, our two guests today, Emmanuel and Jessica for sharing their thoughts, their insight uh, being a little vulnerable with us as well, um, with people who they don't know, <laughs> and sharing some uh, some of their personal experiences. Um, and I thank you all as uh, participants, as audience members, for attending today. And hopefully, you uh, took something away uh, from these stories and these experiences. So I wish everyone a good uh, day, even though it's a little uh, rainy and cloudy outside. All right, take care, everyone.